This episode is sponsored by Tattoo Away, the innovative solution for safe and effective tattoo removal. Unlike traditional laser methods, Tattoo Away uses a non-laser technique called Trans Epidermal Pigment Release, or TEPR, to gently lift and remove tattoo ink from the skin. This method is effective on all ink colors and is suitable for all skin types, minimizing the risk of scarring and promoting healthier skin. With over 8,000 treatments completed worldwide, Tattoo Away has a proven track record of success. If you are considering tattoo removal, revision, or cover-up, visit TattooAway.com to find a location near you and schedule a free consultation. I also want to mention that I'm personally going to go through with the process of removing a tattoo with Tattoo Away. I've had a tattoo on my leg since I was very young. It's kept me from wearing shorts due to the affiliation and its size. Honestly, it's a risk to my life just showing it, so I've finally taken action. The people behind Tattoo Away are incredible. Together, we're working on something really meaningful. For me, this partnership is important because I want people, especially those in prison and getting out of prison, to have the opportunity to remove tattoos that could either hinder them from getting a job or put them at risk once they're out. So thank you guys for considering Tattoo Away. If you want me to personally connect you with them, feel free to reach out to me at carlosvasquez at howtobattle.com. I'll make sure you get what you need, or you can visit TattooAway.com for more information. Thank you. Enjoy the episode. The strongest people are not those who show strength in front of us, but those who win battles we know nothing about. Kat, what does that mean to you? I love that so much because I think there's a lot of value behind the fact that a smile can hold a million tears and a thousand lies of I'm okay. And I think it's like I had a very silent fight. So I think it's a lot of value behind like checking in on friends because I know what it's like to fight a very silent fight and it's a fight that no one deserves to fight alone. Mm, yeah. yeah. And I think like, yeah, strength doesn't always like show itself. Strength shows itself through like smiles and stuff. Very well said. Thank, Thank you. you. Welcome everybody to the How to Battle mm -hmm. podcast. As always, uh, we're blessed with an opportunity to have an incredible guest here, um, Kat Kerr, who I met over Instagram, um, and she has this want, this need. Um, I feel purpose to share her story to share her journey, to share her advice, her wisdom, her knowledge, to share like where she wants to go in life. And um, so she reached out to me, we connected. She came all the way from New <laughs> Finland, yes. Canada. I'm putting Newfoundland on the map. Yeah, New <laughs> Finland, a place I've never heard of, all the way to Los Angeles to uh, do this interview. Um, so I'm incredibly honored by that. So I'm just honored and proud to um, be able to have this platform for somebody that has been through what you've been through to be able to share that. Thank you. I'm yeah. so thankful that you're giving me my voice. Yeah. It's been taken away from me for such a long time. So it's a gift that's priceless in my eyes. And I'm so grateful, yeah. <laughs> honestly. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And you said that you haven't, ever really told your story before never <laughs> so i'm so nervous but <laughs> yeah it's gonna be powerful and mm -hmm. healing yeah. and empowering exactly and so why i will start here why this this want for you to tell your story now because I've been the little girl sitting in math class that wasn't able to focus on my work because of the stuff that I was dealing with. And I know I'm not the only little girl going through that. So I want to be the person that I didn't have. I want to be that person to relate to because I know that there's so many people needing that, not just me. Yeah, exactly. So many little girls and, and, and little boys, boys also. Yeah. yeah. And not yeah. only little. Yeah. And not yeah. only little out there dealing with things that are afraid to speak on them. Yeah. And so why, why, how to battle? Why, you know, did you feel to reach out to me and out of all the podcasters and all the people out there, <laughs> why did you choose to reach out? <laughs> <laughs> because I have a lot of respect for you. I think that 
what you've done for yourself is so admirable and not everyone can do it. Like the way you've turned your life around and everything, it's something that inspired me, honestly. So yeah, yeah it kind of stuck out to me and I'm so thankful to have met you. Thank you very much. Likewise, and <laughs> um, you know, you came in yesterday, um, well, no, the day before yeah. yesterday, and we've been kind of showing you around town and doing <laughs> stuff and uh, getting to know you more. And I think that's such a huge importance for me when um, doing these interviews is to get to actually know the person yeah. a little bit and their true self <clears throat> before we do this. And um, I don't really know a lot into your story, just bits and pieces, which yep. uh, I just want to say that for the people listening that. Um, this will be my first time hearing a lot of this too, which yeah. I think is important. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Hopefully I can shine light on a lot of things. <laughs> yeah, and I, you will. Thank you. Will. you. I, I already know. And So I want to start here. Um, just share a bit about your early childhood and the circumstances that came with that. Okay. So my story started before I even had a story to tell. My birth mom really struggled. So she got into a very bad relationship and really struggled with drugs and alcohol. And unfortunately, the mental struggle of addiction ended up winning. So she ended up doing a lot of drugs and alcohol while pregnant with me. And yeah, so I was born with a lot of issues. And then unfortunately, adoption didn't really go in my favor. And then life kind of led me down that path. <laughs> mm -hmm. So you say your birth mom. So your your birth mom. Um, you, did you ever get to know her a little bit, or did she? Um, or did you? Did she put you up for adoption at a, like a, when you were a baby? So social services ended up getting involved because of the drugs and alcohol, and she actually ended up planning to keep me before that ended up happening. And yeah, so once she put me up she had one request. She requested that me and my brother be adopted into the same household. So the social worker then called my adoptive family and asking if they would take me in, and they said yes. So that's how I ended up with that family. But I ended up finding out who she was because I was having some health issues with my heart before. And I would go into doctor's appointments and they would ask me about my family history. And I'd be like, I don't know anything. And that was really scary. So I applied to get my adoption papers and I ended up finding out who she was while sitting in a dentist chair, which was not really the way I envisioned finding out who she was. How did, how, and how did you find out in that dentist chair? Like, how, did it, how did it come to you? So on, when I got my adoption papers, her name was the only one on my birth certificate. So I went on Facebook and I searched up everyone with her name and I messaged everyone the exact same message. And she ended up being the first person to reply. But first she originally said that I, like she wasn't my birth mom, but then she ended up coming back and was like, actually I am. And that's kind of how it ended up playing out. Wow. Mm -hmm. So Facebook. Yeah. It was like, that's... Powerful. That's powerful. And you said your brother, you had a, you have a brother. Yes. And your brother was adopted with you. Yeah. Um, tell us a little bit about your brother and how far apart you in age you are. And so actually, he was adopted before, so he's four years older. His adoption was planned. So my parents always knew that they were going to get him. And so, yeah, his adoption was planned. And... He actually was born with a lot of issues himself and ended up having struggles himself. What kind? What are some of the issues he has? So he has Asperger's, and because of that, he was really bullied in school. So he also had a really hard go of it, which is why mm -hmm. men's mental health also plays a big factor in my story, because mm -hmm. I watched him struggle. And he actually got bullied out of high school, and then he got bullied out of district school, which is the school kids go to when they can't go to regular high school mm. and then he had to do online school so he had a really tough go of it in that sense people didn't really understand yeah and and your biological father um was any any you did you ever find out who he was no so his name wasn't on my birth certificate and when i asked my birth mom about him she wouldn't really tell me too much about him other than the fact he wasn't a great man he's done a lot of horrible things and at that point i was at peace with it i was like i'm better off without yeah so, so you came into this world you and your brother came into this world into struggle before you before yeah. you even came into this world because your mom used 
drugs and alcohol while you were while she was pregnant with you. Yeah. So we assume maybe she did the same with your brother. She definitely did. Yeah. You I can mean, tell with my brother. Yeah. And then your your father, you guys had the same biological father. Yeah. And he was, a, like you said, a bad person, did yeah. bad things. And so came into the world basically set up to fail in a way. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And that's something that I've really struggled to accept because I was given a hard life before I even had a life to live, really, which was tough. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And I actually have another brother who my birth mom ended up keeping, and he's the middle child. Mm. So, and I probably won't ever end up meeting him, and he probably does not know I exist. And I think that's probably for the better. Yeah. Why do you think that? Because I think at this point, so much time has passed, and I think we've all kind of went our separate ways, and mm -hmm. becoming involved with, our, each, with each other would kind of, like, how do I say this? Put a wrench in things. It would mm -hmm. kind of make everyone's life a bit more complicated than what it needs to be, because there's so much to talk about. Like, no one knows I exist, and I feel like for him, it would kind of be, like, I have two other siblings that I don't know about. Like, it would be hard for him to accept as well. Mm, yeah, I, I understand. I understand that. And just for my advice, like, because I have uh, siblings, uh, half siblings, and um, there was years and years that I never talked to them. Oh, wow. But just be open to it. Yeah. That's all I'm saying. Be open okay. to it. And maybe later in life, and when you're twice the age you are now, and because you're so young, you're 25. Yeah, it's, exactly. It's crazy to think you went through everything you went through in such a short period of time. But my advice in that would just be open to it. And okay. Just, and maybe it's not you that takes the first step, but maybe it's him. Yeah, that's so But being open true. to it, because you never know yeah. where people will be and who they are. And yeah, that's so help. true. So. There's a big part of me that has always wondered about them. And I've always wanted to meet them. But... There's also a big part of me that's nervous about it. Yeah. Like, I don't know the kind of people that they are and everything. Yeah. But, yeah. I don't know, I've always been curious, so we'll see. Yeah. So, your mother, your biological mother, gives you, you and your brother up for adoption to your parents. Your, yes. Your, your, the, the people that will raise you to. Yes. Tell us about that experience um, okay. in, your, in that part of your life. Absolutely. So, unfortunately, adoption life didn't play out in the way that people had hoped. So I was adopted into a family with a fair bit of money. But with that, they wanted two kids to complete the perfect family picture. They weren't really prepared for having kids with inherited issues. And with them being older, like, they're part of a generation which mental health wasn't explored. So they were learning as they go as well. And, yeah, so that was really tricky. And when my brother had all of his issues, stress started to build up in the family and everything. And a lot of verbal abuse ended up going on, fighting, which was very hard on myself, being so young and not understanding what was going on and being really scared and missing my family, honestly. Because yeah. things ended up changing at a very young age. How early on into your, um, your life with your adoptive parents, how early on did you start to notice the mental abuse? I honestly don't remember a time when it wasn't going on, but mm -hmm. I do remember it got really bad around the age of seven. Yeah. Yeah. And what are some of the things um, they did that were that you would consider bad? They convinced me that I was hard to love. They told me that love was a privilege that had to be earned. They told me I was selfish. Like my mom is my biggest bully, which is really heartbreaking for mm -hmm. me to accept. Like. She made me believe I wasn't deserving of love, which was hard. And she made me, she always told me that whoever ends up with me will have their hands full and that like I'm better off not being in a relationship. If I ever did talk about like a relationship or anything, she would shrug it off and say, not a good idea. So mm. she basically convinced me I was nothing, which was really tough. At seven years old. Yes. Wow. Very young age. And what about your stepfather? Did he 
intervene or would he have any things about him that he that it were bad or see that's the thing for a long time i really admired him because he was not nearly as bad as my mom but it really hurts because he was able to watch it happen he never stepped in he was always on my mom's side about everything which was tough like he would sit there and watch as my mom told me that there was stuff wrong with my head that i needed my head checked and she would say like you should be ashamed of yourself and everything so for him to watch that as I get older and I can understand that it's hard yeah yeah I don't understand how people can sit there and watch as their own child is fully having a panic attack and like cannot breathe and just let it happen yeah and then and it just reminds me of the importance of people speaking up because you don't have to be the person directly creating the abuse yeah. or, or hurting somebody. But if you're a bystander who doesn't do anything about it, you're just as bad. Exactly. And exactly. especially a dad who can get in the mix of it and say, and put a stop to it. So yeah. that's an important message that, Absolutely. You know, that I, I feel everybody can learn from that. For sure. Yeah. Like... I think one thing I've been missing is the fact I just needed one person to help me and I just needed one person to kind of be there for me. And for a while I thought my dad was that person, but he was not. So last night we celebrated your birthday, but it it wasn't technically your birthday. And I wanted to celebrate your birthday because you told me something that really stuck with me about that growing up. Yes, okay. So, growing up, I was a very stubborn child. Like, if I didn't want to do something, I was not going to do it. I was always a very nice child, but very hard-headed, and they did not like that at all. And they always knew I was one to be so excited about my birthday and Christmas. I loved it. So that became the first punishment that got taken away. So I've never really experienced too many birthdays or Christmases, which broke my heart as a child. It was so hard. <laughs> so you're, 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 you're a child, and your birthday's coming up, and your mother and father would say you're not having a birthday. Yeah. And I would come up on my birthday at least expecting like a card or happy birthday or something. I would come up and get completely ignored. And I've never really had too many birthday cakes, which has hurt a lot. And I've never really blown out many candles in my life. But that's why I think it's so important because I've held on to that a lot. And my kids will have the biggest birthday parties and my kids will have everything they want. I will be that mom who throws a big birthday bash. I love that. That's and I know you will, and you'll be an amazing mom. Thank and you. That's like taking something that's so evil and so hurtful, and saying I'm not going to repeat that to anybody else in my life that I care yeah. about and love because you know how that makes you feel. Exactly. And it's such a it's 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 just hard for me to like really wrap my brain around that people doing that. And, yeah. And I've seen some pretty bad stuff in my life. And, I know. But that's a different level of um, just... It was you know, torture as yeah. a little girl. Especially because my mom's birthday is actually one day before mine. So I would have to watch her have her birthday and everything. Mm-hmm. And then for me to be non-existent on mine was really tough. And that stuck with me. And, and her reason for doing that is because you were stubborn. Yeah. She wanted to teach me a yeah, lesson. That was her way to... Yeah, wow. it was hard. <laughs> and Christmas, what about Christmases, same thing? Yeah, so Christmases what, wouldn't be as hard as my birthday, honestly. But Christmases, I would come up like expecting Santa and stuff. Mm-hmm. And I would just have to sit there as the three of them ended up opening up their presents, which was really tough. <laughs> yeah. When yeah. was the, um, besides yesterday, <laughs> when was the last birthday you that you were acknowledged or celebrated or you celebrated? I was acknowledged a little bit this year because I kind of have been posting on my Instagram and stuff and I've been sharing about the Mm -hmm. fact I do still find my birthday really hard and a lot of people reached out on my birthday, which I really appreciated a lot more than people think. Nice. And when when is your official birthday? July 12th. (laughs) July 12th. Yep. Okay, I'll never forget it. Thank you. (laughs) July 12th and anybody out there listening... K 
Cat. Uh, what's your Instagram? Catherine, K A T H E R I N E E E K E R R R. Okay, Catherine Kerr, Instagram, July 12th. Yep. Um, you know, make sure acknowledge you. Yes, for that, thank you. You deserve that. Thank you. I really appreciate that mm -hmm. because there's not many anniversaries I still really struggle with. Like, I'm fairly strong in that sense, but my birthday is a tough one yeah. for me. I've never gone past that. Yeah. So aside from the birthdays and the Christmases um, and the, the things that she was saying about you, mm -hmm. um, what else, is there anything else that was happening within that household that you remember that was really significant in you growing up as far as like hurting you? And Well, I think what I witnessed with my brother, like his story is not mine to share too much. So I will steer clear of that a little bit. But what I will say is, like, he did struggle a lot. And I saw a lot at a young age. Like, from the age of seven onwards, I had to be the one to stop him from killing himself, which is something that no child should ever understand. Like, I would come upstairs as I was having a sleepover with friends, and he would be at the top of the stairs with his pill cocktail, he would call it. And I would have to be the one to take the pills from him because I would go upstairs and tell them that, like, oh, he's doing this. And they'd be like, don't worry about it. Like, he's fine. I'm like, but he's not fine. He's hurting. He needs help. And I wish I wasn't the person that had to do that. And you were how old and how old was he when this happened? So he's four years older than me. So seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. So he was 11 and you were seven. Yeah. And he was attempting suicide. Yeah. By taking pills and... It was kind of Everything. ignored. It was kind of like not just overlooked by yeah. your parents. Yeah. And it, as a kid, I didn't really understand it. But something that has stuck out to me now is he used to like being in the hospital because mm. it got him away from that stuff. Like he wouldn't want to come home, mm. which is heartbreaking to yeah. me because a lot of his Christmases were spent in the hospital. Yeah. So... So you grew up in that and you went to school? Yeah, so I did end up going to school and I kind of did struggle in school, honestly. Like, I never was one to get the best grades in school and I was never the one to make the most friends in school. And for a while, I always thought that I was the issue and everything. But now that I get older, I have a lot more compassion for myself because I did go to school every day without fail. And like, I did try my best every day without fail. So I'm going to pat myself on the back for that one. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You, you did. I tried my best. It and wasn't perfect. Did you graduate? Yeah, <coughs> I did. And I got into university as well. Amazing. So, thank Amazing. You. To going through that at home, mm -hmm. all the mental torture dealing and being having to grow quick to, to overlook your brother. Yeah. Going to school and still graduating is yes. amazing. Thank you so That's much. That's such a huge accomplishment at, within itself. Thank and you. Definitely pat yourself on the back and... Did you end up going to university or what path did you take after high school? Where'd you go? So I did end up going to university for a year. And then after a year, I got out of my toxic situation and I had to get out of Newfoundland for a little bit. So I set off traveling and for a while I took a break, but then I ended up going back to do a few more psychology courses and stuff. But life ended up taking me down a different path and I ended up getting real world experiences instead of textbook experiences, mm. which I think is just as valuable. So there was a point in your life and I don't know exactly when mm -hmm. you met somebody else who yeah. ended up being also an abuser. Yes. Outside of your parents. Talk about meeting that person, who the person was, what happened, et cetera. Okay, so going into my grade 12th year, my cousin introduced me to someone from her school and he was the captain of a hockey team. And as a young girl, everyone wants to date the captain of the hockey team. So that got me hooked and I was like, I want him. So we started dating and it turned out to be the fight for my life, literally. He was very abusive early on and took everything from me. But the part that I haven't talked about was how much like I fell victim to young love, honestly. Like I loved him more than I loved myself and I think that's something no one should ever do.
Mm. That's deep because as you say it, I'm thinking about the young women that I've known growing up and seeing that. And even women, when I was younger, in my old ways, seeing a lot of young women, like, like you said, love somebody more than they love themselves. Yeah. And I wonder where that comes from. What do you think? I think for me, I've always been a lover at heart. You know, I love people and I love making people smile. So, and I love helping people and I love watching people succeed. So I think from that point of view, that's why I stuck with it and everything. Mm. But I don't know. So you met this person, the captain of the hockey team. Mm -hmm. And I can imagine because in United States, the, <laughs> the captain of the football team is kind of like yeah. how that would be. Exactly. Yeah, because it's 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 um, a hockey dominated exactly. interest out there. And so you meet him, you, you, you start dating and what kind of abuse were you experiencing with this person? Unfortunately, I experienced all of the abuse. I experienced sexual abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse, mm. all of it, which was really tough because eventually the police ended up having to get involved and they even admitted that he abused me really well. Mm. And they were the ones to tell me how bad the abuse was. Wow. Mm -hmm. uh, so... Yeah. And he was my first boyfriend ever. So my first boyfriend legitimately gave me PTSD, which is hard. Wow. And how long were you two together? Almost three years. Almost so three I stuck years. with him for a long time. And the abuse started how long into the relationship? So the verbal abuse started like two months in and I missed a lot of signs. So I was introducing him to one of my good friends at the time and he called me retarded right in front of her and I ignored that, but that's something that stuck out to her. She was like, that's not good, <laughs> like yeah. at all. And then it kind of just got progressively worse. Yeah. But then the physical abuse actually ended up starting December 23rd, so a few days before Christmas can't remember what year 2019 or 2020 is when it no sorry 2017 i think is when it first mm. started all this just it hasn't been that long no i keep forgetting no. like how young you are and that all these things you experienced was not that far away from today no i got out of the relationship it was five years in may yeah that's and i could see like how you growing up in an abusive environment can yeah. cause you to get into one and kind of stick with it for three years exactly. because it was like common in a sense to you. Exactly. And I think as I go through healing and I try to make sense of it, mm -hmm. that is something that stuck out to my mind as well. Like I understand how I ended up getting into the situation that I did because it mm -hmm. wasn't new to me. I was used to that. That's what I was taught that love was. And something that I learned like, when you're not fed love on a silver spoon, you learn to lick it off of knives. And that's yeah. what happened mm. to me. That's, say that again. When you learn, when you, oh, sorry. <laughs> when you aren't fed love on a silver spoon, you learn to lick it off of knives. And that's what happened to me. I love that. I'm, Thank I'm, you. I, that's, that's so deep. That's why I yeah. love you. Because, yeah, that's powerful. And yeah. It's so true. Yeah. It's so true. Yeah. And, it's heartbreaking. Um, and so th this person that you dated for three years, yep. how did you end it and get out of it? And where is he at now? Okay, so I ended up taking a trip to England to visit my family because my dad's from England. And at that point, although I wasn't telling anyone, the signs were really starting to show. Like. I went down to zero weight. I was starting to lose my hair. I wasn't eating at all. And I just kind of lost my smile, which is really sad. And people started to notice that and started to ask. And eventually people started to be like, leave him kind of deal. So mm. when I went to England, the space did us really well. And I ended up texting him. I was like, I will tell no one what you've done. Just when I get home, drop off my stuff and let's never talk again. And I thought that was the end of it. When, he, when I got home, he did that, and I thought we would never talk again, but that didn't end up happening. We ended up, he ended up coming over again, and long story short, the cops had to be involved because of that. 
and it was tricky. But he is actually now a police officer. He ended up making it into the cadets while he was abusing me. And wow. I helped him get into the force. Wow. How, like, how did you help him get into there? Okay, so he ended up applying because at that point, the RNC, which is Newfoundland Police Force, ended up lowering the requirements. At that point, you only needed one year of post-secondary completed. So he saw that as like a win. He was like, okay, love that. He applied and I didn't really think he would end up getting in. So I was like, okay, I'll support you, whatever. And he passed the interview, which I knew he would because he is, he is the most likable person ever. But then when it got down to the polygraph stage, he started to get really nervous. And I thought he would be out at that stage. I was like, there's no way he can pass that. But he ended up Googling how to cheat on a polygraph test. And in order to do that, he had to make sure his heart rate didn't fluctuate and that he didn't sweat while lying. But he needed my help for that. So he ended up asking me or telling me to tell him repeatedly for the weeks leading up to the exam that I had to say, you didn't hurt me. You were going to pass the exam over and over and over again. And I really didn't think it would work, but he ended up passing the polygraph test and ended up getting in. And I don't think he would have gotten in if I didn't do that which is something I struggle with. That is... Forgiveness of myself for that. Yeah, that is fascinating in a way. It's yeah. Like how that all happened. And you can... It, it just shows, like, how really, like, hurt you were. And yeah. And I even say even to the extent of, like, broken in a way. I was. Because you're, like, helping this person who abused you. You're helping the abuser. It's almost like when people protect the abuser... And you're going out of your way to accelerate himself to become a police officer. Mm -hmm. And having to go through that lying about that is like the, me just, you know, what that does to you mentally. Yeah. Because you're like almost convincing yourself. Exactly. It really was. It was such a, like now that I look back on it, it was such a crazy thing that happened. And I'm not sure if I ever will forgive myself for that because... I can't get him out of the force. Like, I'm the reason he now has a gun, and in Canada, they're not legal. So not many people have guns in Canada. Mm. And in Newfoundland, it's so small. So, yeah, it's been tricky. Yeah. But I also think, like, I did that, A, because I was scared of what would happen if I didn't help him, but also because I loved him so much, I wanted to see him succeed so much that I didn't care that the harm that that brought me at the time. Yeah. And that's been tricky. Did the police know about what he did to you before he became a police officer or after? Before, actually. So yeah. the investigation ended up starting out, I think, when he was halfway through cadet training. And my investigation concluded within two and a half months, which is extremely fast. So it was treated differently because he was a cadet. Mm. And, yeah, they essentially said because he was in the force learning all of that information, he knew how to get away with it. So there's nothing I can ever do about it. Mm. But I've also learned after it, there was multiple, because I wasn't really necessarily looking for justice with him. I don't want him to go to jail, and I stand by that. I really don't. I want to give him the benefit of the doubt that he's young and that he can learn from this. But I stand by the fact that he should not be allowed to be a police officer. Like, you know, and yeah. Yeah, I... They've never taken him out. And six police officers were involved with letting him through and after seeing what he's done, mm -hmm. which is something I've never been able to forgive Newfoundland for, honestly. Because at a young age, you're taught to call 911 in case of an emergency. And I did that. And I got so many consequences for that. Mm, yeah. Yeah. And so you live in, you're in New Finland still. Yeah. And you have to, so it's a, it's a small town. Mm -hmm. So do you see him or like, or do you, you see those officers that were all a part of getting him in there? I, I mean, how does that feel? See, that's the kind of sad part. My quality of life in Newfoundland is not the best. I pretty much only go on hikes. I yeah. go to work and that's kind of it. Yeah. I'm pretty scared to go out, honestly, because at this point I've shared my story and I don't 
know what he'll do if he sees me, you know? Mm. I imagine he's not very happy with me doing this. Yeah. So it's kind of terrifying. Yeah, and it makes sense why you're such a world traveler. Thank you, yeah, it I, does. <laughs> I get it, because you've traveled all over the world and you're young and you've spent time all over and you seek opportunities to leave. Yeah. And I get it because you're almost like imprisoned in New Finland, in Finland. Yeah. And then you're afraid because you don't know when you're going to run into this person and how they're going to respond. So your peace comes from escaping. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like for a long time and even kind of still, I had such a fear of Newfoundland, which is heartbreaking to me because as you might be able to tell, like I kind of do love Newfoundland. Like mm -hmm. I think it's some one of the most beautiful places ever, but I just can't be there anymore. It's yeah. too much hurt and too much fear. Yeah. Like, for me, it also kind of comes down to the fact, like, when I have kids one day, I don't know how I can live there, tell them about this, and then say that he is the one in charge of protecting us in case if we ever have an emergency. Yeah, it comes down to that as well. Yeah, what, what message would you give to a young lady who is in an abusive relationship at a, kind of with the one you were in, like with him, and you did the way you did. You left and then you called him and told him you were over, it's done. Mm -hmm. And that worked for you mm -hmm. to get out. Mm -hmm. Like, What advice would you give other um, young people or even older people who are in an abusive relationship who are afraid or don't know how to get out? I would say that you're a lot smarter than what they're giving you credit for. And I would tell them to trust yourself and to never love someone more than you love yourself because like, if you're in an abusive relationship, the hardest part is leaving. So once you leave, you've got the hard part over with. You still have a long road ahead of you of healing and everything, but you're safe now. And find comfort in the fact that it's only up from there. Right. But Beautiful. Thank you. Beautiful. And after you got out of the relationship, you discovered that you were... At, you were um, Told by doctors, you were diagnosed with complex PTSD. PTSD, yeah. and how did did you? What drove you to go seek help, and how did you discover that that's what you had, and what is that? Okay, so it was kind of a long road over the past five years of it. So obviously, I went off traveling and everything, and. Italy, I think Milan saved me. I don't think I would be alive if I didn't go there. But eventually traveling did kind of turn into avoidance, which became unhealthy for me. So when I moved to BC, that's when things kind of took a turn for the worst because at that point the PTSD was starting to fully take over and I just wasn't dealing with it. And I thought because I was so young, I was invincible, and I actually ended up getting into a serious mountain biking accident in Whistler, and I have no idea how to mountain bike. I just honestly stopped caring about my life. I didn't care if I lived or died, and I actually did almost die there. So, yeah. And then I came home. I started to realize, like, this isn't something I can handle on my own anymore. And I got my complex PTSD diagnosis, which was one of the hardest parts for me. It was a really big reality check. At that point, I knew it wasn't an easy fix. And at that point, I just started focusing all on healing. What were some of the, or what are some of the symptoms of complex PTSD that you noticed? For me, it kind of showed up a bit differently. So I was never the person to cry a lot, and I was never the person to really show all that stuff. But for me, it showed up with doing a lot of reckless stuff. It showed up by not caring about things, kind of being angry at the world, and sort of like that. And yeah, just losing myself. Like, if you look back on pictures of myself of those years, you can tell that the lights are on, but nobody's home. Mm. Wow, and that drove you to, um, to, seek, to seek help or understanding as to why you were going through that. Yeah, because then, I think for me and doing a few psychology courses, I've always known I had it. Mm -hmm. I really did. But for me, being so young and receiving that diagnosis was so daunting to me. I really did not want to be like a 20 year old with PTSD. So I put it off as long as I could. Yeah. Yeah. It reminds me of when I was taking psychology courses in prison and I 
in, while I was, um, well, I took psychology courses in prison, but I studied psychology when I was in solitary confinement. Oh, wow, good for you. Yeah, and I started to learn about the symptoms, and I was recognizing PTSD symptoms in myself. Wow. Like, you know, like nightmares and feelings of guilt and shame. Yeah. And anxiety, and I was like, uh, okay, there it is. Now what can I do? And I started to figure out ways to overcome it through like breathing and Absolutely. meditation, just all these different natural ways. And it helped me a lot. And then that's when I started to get on the path and I figured out the different principles in my life to help me to overcome it. And Good for you. So I, I get that how like knowledge, seeking knowledge mm -hmm. can help you discover things that you feel and then you can find ways to heal them. Absolutely. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. And you mentioned that M Milan saved your life. Yes. Elaborate yeah. a little bit on that. So it's kind of like sad when I think back on it. So when they were doing the investigation, they had to take my phone and things like that. And in that, they were going through my search history. And in my search history, they found like me searching up like how to kill myself which is really heartbreaking and they called me and they asked me if i was okay and i told them yes but in my head i was so not okay but at that point i knew like it's getting pretty dangerous like i have to get out somehow so yeah i found au pairing and i kind of set off traveling i left <laughs> and au pairing for people that don't know because i didn't know what au pairing <laughs> was until you told me what is au pairing and and you do it's it's amazing for people out there that I want to pursue a way out and to travel, what is au pairing? So au pairing is a wonderful way for young people especially to travel and see the world. It is basically a more chill nanny. So you find a family anywhere around the world and they'll either fly you out or you fly out yourself and you live with them. And you're basically like a big sister to the families and yeah, you get a weekly balance of pay and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, nice. travel. It's super. It saved me. It really did save me. I needed to do that. Yeah. And you've been doing that ever since you, you, the first time you left? Yep. So I have lived in Milan, Italy, then New York, then Whistler, BC, then Vancouver, BC, then Quebec, and then Venice, Italy. But I wasn't oh. in Venice, Italy for too, too long. Okay. <laughs> wow. Yeah, all in five years, <laughs> and I and I didn't experience COVID. I've never been into a lockdown before because, yeah, yeah. I know, I kind of like cheated the system a little bit. So what I basically did was as soon as I heard that a lockdown was coming into a place, I booked a flight right away to go to a place that wasn't in lockdown. Because, Amazing. yeah, like going through all that stuff, I could not be in a lockdown. I could not be locked in the house at all. I was terrified of that, so wow. I found a way out of it. <laughs> Very smart. Thank you, I know. Yeah, that's a great strategic <laughs> way of you travel. You miss the lockdowns. You... Yeah. Wow. So when people talk about COVID, I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> I've been living my life ever since, and I've never caught COVID. That's amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, that's it's incredible. my claim to fame. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. So complex PTSD, how, do you know like how common that is how like do more people like suffer from that than we think absolutely yeah. that's something that i'm learning because i've always been the advice friend i'm the friend that kind of can help you with anything and i know a lot more people are struggling than what we think and yeah. the quote you said in the beginning you know people yeah. don't see the struggles people only see like what we appear as strength yeah. but I think people would be surprised about how many people are actually struggling with complex PTSD and just PTSD in general. People that are struggling with that, what is some advice you would give them? Like, how have you been able to um, function and do all the things you do and even be here talking <laughs> about all this so well? Thank you. And it's, it's, it's just incredible. You, you're so mature for your age. Thank you. How, what advice would you give to others who are dealing with um, complex PTSD or any form of PTSD? I would say don't lose hope because mm -hmm. it's scary and it's a hard road. And I would also say, like, expect healing to hurt because it's going to hurt. But the hurt will pay off because once you see yourself overcoming milestones that once seemed far away, that is when healing becomes worth it. And that is when the pain becomes a lot less painful. But you just have to keep holding on. Yeah. And 
I would also say to have a meaningful long-term goal, like have something that you wholeheartedly want that is maybe like 10 years down the road mm. because then you have a reason to not give up. That's amazing. Thank you. Amazingly wise for <laughs> such a young age. And Thank you. It makes me, we talked about it, um, I think yesterday in the car about our struggles, our hardships, our adversities, our pain. Um, once we battle through them, those things becoming the things that propel us forward in life. Of and, course. And allow us to be great. And I see that in you, like all the stuff you went through. Thank you. Is showing now in the person you are. Thank you. Like doing what you're doing and being able to speak on it and and where you're going to go in life, <laughs> you know, which I know is going to be amazing. And the more you do this and reach out and help people. So for people out there that are going through something, it's like you just have to get through it and, and fight through it and get help through it and don't Absolutely. give up. Because eventually you will get to a point where you look back and say, that I needed all of that, as bad and ugly as it was, for yeah. me to be the person I am now. For sure. All right, that's how you. That's how you conquer that and beat that. You can't, because if not, you can let it keep you into a mental prison and break you. Absolutely, for sure. And I also think people should know that it's okay to break down a little bit. You know, like when you, because I, I didn't know that. I thought I had to be strong all the time, and I thought like it didn't hurt me. So I think people should know that. Strength is also having the courage to ask for help. You don't have to handle everything on your own. Yeah. Have you, do you, or have you um, still talk to your parents, your adoptive parents? Yeah, I yeah. do. But I think, I think in the coming years, things will end up changing a little bit. Yeah. Because I think something that I've actually never gotten over and I always kind of thought that I did, was when I ended up telling my mom about my abusive relationship, she was lying on her bed on her phone. And I was telling her with tears streaming down my face and she ended up yelling at me and saying, well, what did you do? And mm -hmm. certain things like that, I just, I don't think that's forgivable because I think about if I was in her shoes, like if I was a mom and my kid was coming to me telling me all this, like. I would never do that. Like that makes me sick thinking of a mom doing that to their child. Yeah. And your one of your goals and one of your <laughs> one of your goals and dreams is to be a, a mom. Yeah. So that is what keeps me going in life. I truly and one thousand percent believe that I would not be here if it wasn't for my love for kids. And actually I brought this to show you <laughs> something awesome. a little kid gave me. Uh -huh. Oh, sorry, I gotta find it. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> and just to say, we, you work with kids. Yes. Today. You... I'm a preschool gymnastics coach with so much pride. <laughs> awesome. Okay, so this is a little bracelet a little kid made. But the sweet story behind it is the kid came into gymnastics co like class so excited to give this to me. And at the end of the class, the dad told me what she said on the way to gymnastics. She was like, do you think Coach Cat will like this bracelet? And her dad was like, of course. And then the little girl said, I like Coach Cat. She's like a girl, but she has sparkles in her eyes. And oh. that made me smile because wow. I don't doubt that there's a sparkle in my eye when I'm around kids. It mm. is my happy place. <laughs> That's beautiful. And you do have sparkle in your eyes. <laughs> and, Thank you. And it's like kids need you. Thank you. Yeah, they need you. You're, but, you have your own kids. But your work with kids, I feel, is kind of like your calling in a way. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, there's yeah. something very special in it, for and sure. It's beautiful that you brought that here. And, <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's something that I will hold on to for my whole life because at that point I was like, okay, like I'm going to achieve my goal. I'm going to be such a great mom when the time is right. And yeah. just like you said, like the kids need me. But... I needed them so much more than mm. they needed me at that time. Like, they don't know it, but every hug I get from, like, mm. a three-year-old or a four-year-old heals the little kid in me. Wow. And it just makes me smile. Yeah. <laughs> I love them. <laughs> That's beautiful. Thank you. And your brother, have you talked to him or you're not... Like any, um, where, how is he or where is he at in life? Okay, so he ended up leaving Newfoundland, I think, when I was about 18. And originally he moved to Toronto, but unfortunately I have not seen him since I was 18 and I haven't talked to him in about two years and I have no idea where he is. 
which is really heartbreaking for me because he's the only blood person I know, yeah. <laughs> which is tricky. Yeah, it is. Um, and you can't control that because we don't know what he's dealing with. We don't know the struggle and the pain he's, he's compartmentalizing and exactly. what that's doing to him. And, and it's almost like, um, it's, it's like you said, it's, it's hard because I know you would be open to being in his life. And, yeah. But he has to be ready. Exactly. And so yeah. we just hold, we, I guess in a way we just hope and pray for the best for him. Absolutely. You know, and, yeah. and for him to, at the right time when he's ready to emerge. Absolutely. Like, I think I owe my brother a lot of credit for keeping me here, honestly, because where I watched him struggle so much growing up and I watched him still be alive, mm -hmm. like he taught me to not give up. Like he taught me that I can get through it. So, and he also taught me the importance of men's mental health as well. Right. So yeah, I wish him so well and I love him a lot. And he taught you that and you're teaching everybody that's listening to this podcast, including myself, how to get through challenges, how to get through some of the worst stuff you can imagine. I mean, just where you're at now and um, where you're going to be and where do you want to be and where do you go from here when you go back and you, to New Finland? Where do you go from there? That's a great question. I'm still in the process of figuring everything out and I'm okay with that because I'm sure I will figure it out. But I'm going to go home and I'm going to educate people at home because I think a lot of people at home could benefit off of a little bit of education surrounding this. And eventually I see myself speaking in schools because I want to help kids around the age that I was when things started to get rough for me. And I just want to help people. I don't know how I'm going to help people, but I'm going to help people. <laughs> yep. And that's how, that's literally when I, I told myself when I was in prison and I, and I first got out, I don't know what I, what I, I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I just want to help people. Yeah. And I started to explore and try things and discover things. Absolutely. And, and found my purpose and do the same. Good just be, you. be a helpful person, be a kind person, always looking for ways to help in, in areas that call to you in your heart, like young, you know, kids around the age when you start to yeah. experience that trauma working with them and you'll, you'll find the direction, you'll find that. And so I think that's great. You said that you're okay with not really knowing, but you'll yeah. figure it out. That's a, such a important answer for young people out there who feel like this pressure, like they need to figure out what they need to do, but exactly they don't. Yeah, right? exactly. Cause if there's one thing I've learned, it's that life does not go as planned. You yeah. know, you can have everything planned down to a T and it won't go. So I would just say to, just because you're young, it doesn't, like you don't have to have everything figured out right away, you know? Yeah. And I have two more questions for you. Absolutely. Before we go, and I, I feel that there's so much, such a powerful message and story in such a short period of time. Yeah. So this won't be the last time you're here. <laughs> I definitely want to have you back to see Thank where you're you. at in life. But looking back, what would you tell your younger self, the girl who was enduring abuse from her parents, if you could speak to her today? <laughs> I would tell her that I know you're scared and I know you're terrified that things won't work out, but you're going to be okay. It's going to be a long road ahead of you, but the person that you make it out will make it feel so, so worth it. And I would also tell her that I may, like, I'm going to make you proud. Mm, thank you. That's beautiful. Thank you. Everything I do is for a little cat. <laughs> like, I think because I love kids so much, the way I kind of got through it was picturing myself as a little kid. And if I wouldn't want it for a little kid, I'm not going to treat myself that way. Yeah. Like, do it for a little cat. <laughs> yeah. And what message of hope do you want to leave with those listening, especially for those who feel they are in the darkest moments of their lives? I would tell them, in a world that's mean, be kind. Because it's a long road ahead of you, but it's a road worth taking, healing is. Just trust yourself. 
you're gonna be okay. It's worth taking. Healing's hard, but it's worth doing. Thank you so much, Kat, for being here. You Thank are you. what How to Battle is all about. Thank you. exemplify you. that. You've battled through so much and you're continuing to battle through it with such a like kind spirit, Thank such a you. great outlook on life and a great calling and wanting to help people. Thank you. And I'm like extremely honored to have you on here. I'm really so appreciate grateful. it. And you, you've done an amazing job here today sharing <laughs> so your story. Nervous. Thank you. <laughs> for the first time. Yeah. So I encourage you to continue to share. Thank you. Every chance you get. And uh, if I could help in any way, you, you know, you have a, um, a new friend in me now. And, Thank you. Um, you know, my family is your family. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. I'm so honored because coming from Newfoundland, we don't really get these opportunities and chances. So even just to be here is a complete honor. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.